Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, uh, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the world of green hydrogen production. Okay. Specifically, a process called alkaline electrolysis. Sounds good. Um, you're interested in getting to those aha moments. Quick. Okay. So we're diving right in. Let's do it. Our guide for this deep dive is a document called Alkaline Electrolysis. Yeah. A step-by-step -step process guide. Okay. Get ready to see how we can essentially zap water into a clean energy source. It really is remarkable what we can do with a bit of electricity and a cleverly designed setup. Okay. You know, we're essentially mimicking a natural process. Yeah. Just sped it up and harnessing the output. So you're saying there's more to this than just plugging water into an outlet. We need some kind of special setup. Exactly. Think of it like this. Oh, right. Green hydrogen is the fuel of the future, mm -hmm. especially as we rely more on solar and wind power. Right. But those energy sources are intermittent, right? Yeah. The sun isn't always shining and the wind isn't always blowing. Right. So we need a way to store that energy for when we need it. Yeah. That's where hydrogen comes in. Precisely. And alkaline electrolysis is one of the cleanest and most efficient ways to produce that hydrogen. Okay. The only byproduct is oxygen, which is a pretty good deal. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. But how do we actually get from water to hydrogen? Yeah. I'm picturing like a mad scientist with bubbling beakers. Okay. What's the first step in this alkaline electrolysis process? The first step involves preparing our key ingredient. Okay. The electrolyte. All right. We use a solution of either potassium hydroxide okay. or sodium hydroxide in water. So those are pretty common chemicals, right? I remember using them back in high school chemistry. Yeah. What makes them so special for this process? When these compounds dissolve in water, they dissociate, okay. meaning they break up into charged particles called ions. Mm. These ions are the real stars of the show. So it's not the chemicals themselves, but what happens to them in water. I'm intrigued. Tell me more about these ions and why they're so important. The potassium or sodium ions become positively charged, Okay. while the hydroxide ions, mm -hmm. sim symbolized as OH, okay. become negatively charged. Okay. These OH ions are the real workhorses of alkaline electrolysis. Okay. They're the ones that ultimately help split the water molecules. Okay, so we've got our electrolyte solution with its free-floating ions ready to interact. Yes. What happens next? How do we actually get the energy flowing? That's where step two comes in, okay. applying voltage. Right. We need a direct current, or DC, mm -hmm. between two electrodes, okay. a positive anode and a negative cathode. So basically, we're creating an electrical pathway through the solution, like setting up a tiny electric racetrack for those ions. A great analogy. Okay. Think of the voltage as the starting gun for the race. Okay. It provides the energy boost needed to kick off the process of split in water molecules. You mentioned this is like mimicking a natural process. Yeah. Is this how hydrogen is formed in nature too? In a way, yes. Okay. There are natural processes that split water molecules. Okay. But they're not nearly as efficient oh. or controlled right. as what we can do with alkaline electrolysis. Okay. It's about harnessing and accelerating those natural forces. I see. So we've applied a voltage to our solution, yeah. creating a charged environment. Yes. What happens to those ions we talked about earlier? Oh. Do they just sit there or do they start moving around? This is where it gets interesting. Remember okay. those negatively charged hydroxide ions? Yeah. Well, they're naturally attracted to the positive anode. Okay. It's like a magnetic pole. So those OH ions are off to the races, heading straight for the positive electrode. Right. What about the potassium or sodium ions? Do they join the party too? They play a crucial role in maintaining the overall electrical balance. Okay. They're like the crowd control, making sure everything runs smoothly. So we've got all this movement happening in the solution. I imagine things are starting to get pretty lively at the anode. Yeah. What happens when those OH ions reach their destination? That brings us to step four. Okay. A critical point in the process. All right. The oxygen evolution reaction, or OER. Okay. It's here at the anode where water molecules get split. Okay, so this is where we actually start generating the products we want. Yeah. Hydrogen and oxygen. Correct. But what exactly happens during this oxygen evolution part? Is it as dramatic as it sounds? Well, evolution in this case refers to the release of oxygen gas okay. at the anode. Mm -hmm. Those hydroxide ions get oxidized, oh. which means they lose electrons. Mm -hmm. As a result, oxygen gas is formed and released. Wait, so we're actually making breathable oxygen in this process. Yeah. That's a cool bonus. 
It's like having a tiny oxygen factory right there. Exactly. And remember those electrons that were lost? Yes. They don't just disappear. Whoa. They play a crucial role in no. powering the other half of the process. Okay, so we have oxygen bubbling out at the anode, and electrons are on the move. Yeah. What happens next? Yeah. Does this mean we're about to see hydrogen production in action? We're getting there. Okay. But before we jump to the other side, mm -hmm. there's one crucial component we need to talk about. Okay. The diaphragm. Okay. This is step five. The diaphragm. That sounds familiar from biology class. Yeah. What's its role in electrolysis? Is it some kind of filter? Think of it as more of a separator. Okay. The diaphragm, or sometimes a membrane, mm -hmm. sits between the anode and the cathode. Okay. And prevents the hydrogen and oxygen gas from mixing. Okay. Remember, we're generating both gases. Yeah. And mixing them could be problematic. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Safety first. So the diaphragm keeps the gases separate, but what about those busy little ions? Can they still move freely between the electrodes? That's the clever part. Okay. The diaphragm is selectively permeable. Okay. Which means it allows certain ions to pass through mm. while blocking others. This ensures that the electrolysis process can continue smoothly and safely. So it's like a carefully controlled border crossing for ions. Yeah. Ensuring that only the right ones get through to maintain balance. Right. What ions get the VIP treatment? The OH ions get a free pass, okay. which is essential for maintaining the overall electrical balance. Okay. The potassium or sodium ions can also cross. Okay. But only as needed to keep the system neutral. It's amazing how this process is so intricately balanced. Yeah. So the diaphragm is keeping things organized and safe. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm really curious about that hydrogen production you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Is that what happens on the other side of the cathode? You got it. We've reached step six, okay. which takes us to the cathode, okay. where the hydrogen evolution reaction, or AR, takes place. Right. This is where those traveling electrons finally come into play. Okay, so we have our electrons arriving at the cathode. Yes. What happens next? Do they just hang out there, or do they interact with something? At the cathode, water molecules gain the electrons that traveled from the anode. Okay. This process called reduction mm -hmm. splits the water molecules producing hydrogen gas, okay. which bubbles out. So it's like a reunion at the cathode. Yeah. Electrons meeting up with water molecules to create hydrogen gas. Yeah. It's remarkable how all these pieces fit together so perfectly. Yeah, it is. But what about the OH ions? Are they still involved at this stage? They're essential. Right. The reduction reaction at the cathode also produces new OH ions, okay. which are released back into the electrolyte. Okay. This is what makes the process so brilliant. I'm sensing there's a but coming. What's the catch? There's no catch, just brilliant chemistry at work. Okay. Those newly formed OH ions are crucial for replenishing the electrolyte right. and keeping the entire process running smoothly. Okay. That brings us to step seven. All right. The regeneration of the electrolyte. Yeah. It's a beautiful cycle. Okay. I'm ready to have my mind blown. Yeah. Tell me how this electrolyte regeneration works and why it's so important. Remember how we started with either potassium hydroxide? Yes. Or sodium hydroxide as our electrolyte. Mm -hmm. Well, those new OH ions combine with the potassium or sodium ions, okay. essentially replenishing the electrolyte. So the process sort of feeds itself. Yeah. That's incredibly efficient. It's like a closed loop, constantly regenerating the key ingredient. Exactly. It's this clever regeneration that makes alkaline electrolysis so sustainable and effective for long-term hydrogen production. I am loving this. Okay, so we have a constant cycle of breaking down and reforming the electrolyte. Yes. Are there any other key steps we need to cover in this process? Step eight highlights the importance of maintaining electrical neutrality. Okay. It's all about balance. Okay, so how does the process stay balanced with all these ions moving around? Is there some kind of internal regulation system? As the OH ions move towards the anode, oh, yeah. the potassium or sodium ions migrate as needed to ensure that there's no buildup of charge anywhere in the system. Okay. This constant movement keeps everything running smoothly and prevents any electrical hiccups. So it's like a carefully choreographed dance of ions all moving in sync to keep the electrical current flowing. Exactly. We've covered a lot of ground here from the electrolyte solution to the diaphragm and those busy ions. Yes, we have. What's the final step in this remarkable process? Step nine is the culmination of all those carefully orchestrated steps. Right. The continuous production of hydrogen and oxygen gas. Okay. As long as we keep applying that voltage, mm -hmm. the process will keep churning out these valuable gases. It's truly remarkable how we can take something as simple as water 
and through this series of chemical reactions, right. transform it into these powerful fuel sources. Yeah. But where do the gases go from here? Do they just float away or do we collect them? They're too valuable to just let float away. Right. Both the hydrogen and oxygen are collected and stored separately. Oh, great. Ready to be used as fuel or in various industrial applications. So we've gone from simple water to separated hydrogen and oxygen ready for use. Yeah. It's mind-blowing how elegant and efficient this process is. It is. I'm already thinking about all the possibilities. It really highlights the ingenuity of using simple chemistry and physics mm -hmm. to create solutions for a cleaner future. Before we get too carried away, <sighs> I'm curious, what's the one thing that stands out to you about this whole process? What makes it so special? What fascinates me most is that we're taking advantage of fundamental natural processes and scaling them up to meet our energy needs. Yeah. It's a testament to the power of science and its potential to create a more sustainable future. I totally agree. It's amazing how something as seemingly simple as water can hold the key to a cleaner energy future. And we've only just scratched the surface of what's possible. Yeah. There's so much more to explore. Yeah. And I'm excited to see what the future holds for alkaline electrolysis and green hydrogen. Me too. Before we dive deeper into those possibilities, let's take a quick break. We'll be back soon to explore the implications of this technology and what it means for the future.